All right, so I've got an interesting project here today. Uh, a couple days ago, a friend of mine reached out and said, hey, I've got some computers. They're about 30 way minutes away from my house. They're running a whole bunch of very complicated math, and every now and again, they'll lock up, and I can't reboot them remotely, uh, and I'd like a way to be able to, essentially, using a, an app or something on the computer, to be able to send it a message and say, hey, reboot that computer. So I did a little bit of poking around to see what people were doing, and the buttons on a computer, the one on the front, works very simple. Uh, it just literally is crossing two wires together uh, on the switch for a, a fraction of a second and then opening them again. And that's enough uh, that the computer can detect that the users push the reset button or the power switch, I mean, and recycle the computer. So it goes off and then goes back on again. So what I've done here is I've set up a little microcontroller. This is an ESP86 or um, ESP8266 and it's in the ESP01 package, which means it just has a couple IO ports, uh, 0 and 2. And that's not quite enough to run something like this because he's got uh, about a dozen computers, and we don't want to have a dozen of these, one connected up to each computer. And that's just such overkill anyway. So what I've done is I've gone and I've wired this up in the breadboard. I've got two 8-bit bit registers here and these allow us to communicate with the Arduino code and send a signal down and then be able to turn on one of the 16 outputs and the, each of these has their 8 bits so each one of them has 8 out, uh, outbound pins and so that makes 16 between the two. Now I can very easily control exactly which one or more than one, although we're just going to use one of these pins that we want to send high. And by doing so, that's going to send a message uh, essentially up a wire, which will cross those two and will tell the computer to reboot. This will all be done via a phone app. And this is a real simple MQTT client. So I've got this already all wired up. Let's see if I can turn this on. If I hit one, you can see the first one, the first one's on the far right here, went on, I hit two, so that turns number two on, three, and so on. I didn't put all the buttons on, I just have a handful, so I've got one through eight and then 16, so 16's all the way over here on the far left. So you can see what this is doing. This is sending a message, it's going out, it's being uh, to a server from the tablet, and then it's coming back on this little ESP01 device right there. And then it goes ahead and flips the corresponding bit. So that's how that side is going to work. Now in the computer itself, because we don't want to wire anything directly to the computer, I built this little uh, um, uh, octo isolator. And what this thing does is it doesn't mechanically have anything connected between the right side and the left side. So internally, this is just a piece of shrink tubing. This has two components. Well, there's actually three because I have a resistor in that one. Um, on the left, we have this photoresistor. Now, a photoresistor, when there's no light, is going to have a very high resistance. Uh, in this tubing here, it's a, it's a couple million ohms. Then, when there's light on it, like if we were to shine it right up into the light, or, in our case, we're going to shine an LED directly into it, that resistance is going to drop to about 200 ohms. And that's going to be essentially a short circuit for the computer. So the way this works is, is this is on the computer side. This is going to go right straight into the motherboard and connect those two pins together on the reset uh, or the power. This will be inside the shrink tubing, and they'll be essentially touching, but nothing mechanically or um, electrically touching. They'll be physically touching. And then I'm going to, when we turn on the corresponding LED, it won't be in this breadboard, but it'll actually be in the shrink tubing. And it will turn this on. It will change the resistance of this resistor and equivalently reboot the computer or restart the computer. So this will be, each computer will have one of these packaged up exactly like this. Can't quite decide if I'm going to have the resistor in here or in the board itself. So this will all get put into one of these perf boards and it'll have um, the two uh, chips, the two bit shift registers. It'll have a rail, it'll have something like this. It'll be a couple of them actually, which the wires will come out of here into the computers. And then I'm also gonna have a voltage regulator so we can run it off of five volts, uh, USB, and then I'll have room for the controller. 
Uh, so that'll get placed somewhere over here. So that's where I'm at right now on this project. I started the layout. I'm not exactly sure how I want this laid out. Um, but the next step is, is I want to lay this out and then I'm going to go ahead and get it soldered onto this board and we'll see how it looks. All right, let's take a look at this circuit. So this right here, our main chip, is a 8-bit uh, uh, shift register. Um, mine's like an SN595. Here, I've got a stack of them right here. Um, so these are going to enable us to communicate with up to eight different devices, or at least eight outputs. Uh, this doesn't do any inputs. So I didn't draw them all in here, but these will be going out to a couple of different LEDs. One is where I'm going to have a LED on the board so I know when they're being driven high. And then the second is going to be a, a header on there which will hook these opto isolators up so that we can actually turn the computer on and off. All right, so here's the design I came up with. Uh, a couple of different iterations, and even this I changed slightly in the final implementation. Uh, so I've got my two chips right here, and I decided to put a header in, and this has two rows. They're both female, and so each side will do eight, and these are just ever so slightly offset so that the pins line up. And then I have to bring this one, which is A, kind of around the side. Now I really, really wanted LEDs on the top, so we had some indication. Now I didn't need to put those in. For test purposes, I could have just put LEDs in here, but, but I really wanted LEDs in here. So I did put them in, and that turned out to just be a real pain. So here, what I was originally thinking of doing is having one ground, or actually two grounds, one, and then two rows of LEDs, and then jump around them. Um, but that proved to be very, very difficult. What I ended up doing, and it worked out pretty well, uh, but still not ideal, is essentially zigzagging back and forth through each of these negatives so that then I could just bring these pins straight up. So you can see here I actually ran wires around the headers and then directly to the LEDs. So this turned out to be 50% of the time, uh, or actually more because I screwed it up the first time. So this, uh, if you don't want LEDs, I would highly recommend skipping that part. So right here is my ESP01, and I have it setting right like this, so with the headers on the right, uh, so it kind of sits and, and leans over. And then these are my um, pull-up resistors, and, and one I, I just have written in in pencil here because I was originally thinking I was going to put it over here, but then I decided to, to line them all up on this side. Over here I've got my voltage regulator. This is uh, LM317 with a couple resistors in order to set it to 3.3 volts. Uh, I've got a capacitor and then got to have an LED, so I've got a on -board, or an on LED just indicates whether or not the circuit is running. So that's all there is to it on the design. Um, it's actually, it doesn't come out too, too bad, uh, but we do have some overlaps here and I put them in dotted lines where I was going to run them on the top of the board. Uh, normally I try to just run everything on the bottom of the board, but because I had so many overlap here, I ended up doing a couple on the top. So that's the, the design. So let's take a look at what the, the final board, how it turned out. Uh, so here it is. The I've got the LM or the ESP01 right here, uh, and that's just a little socketed, so I can take it out, program it, put it back in. Um, underneath here, I've got those three pull-up resistors, and like I said, I've kind of got this wire coming around because I needed that um, TX pin, and it needs to go up here. Uh, and then over here I've got my LED, uh, and then I've got a couple couple wires running on top. This one here in the middle, this is actually my 3.3 volt, so I kind of ran that on the top. Uh, that did actually turn out to be a pain because these through holes um, do conduct, so I ended up having a short on the bottom, so I had to redo a couple things there. <clears throat> Then up here across the top, I'll just turn it around. I've got these LEDs, uh, so these turn on whenever there's a, a pulse coming through. And then this, I just have an LED plugged in, but this is my, um, the bottom is the out, and then the, right now, I guess it technically goes this way. So the bottom here is the data out, and then the top is ground on both of these. And what I'm thinking of doing, since this is eight and eight, 
Um, I'm thinking of splitting these up and doing two Cat 5s in each to run over to the computers. So I'm going to probably mess with that and, and see how that works. So let me just flip this over. So here's the back side, all of its glory. Um, not a whole lot to talk about here. This is the top. I'll uh, zoom in just a little bit. So this is, these are the LEDs, and as you can see, they're kind of zigzagging back and forth. Um, and it did work out okay. It was a little bit hard to get them in there, and then I brought these wires up. Now these wires, because I needed to, there's a couple ways to do it, but I decided that I wanted to come around from this side and run them on the top. So that's all these white wires here. So they're just coming around, patching in, and then going up to the top. Then I've got a couple that cross over, like this one. This is the A uh, out that has to cross over. Uh, but all the rest of them, uh, and I could have run this on the top too. I just decided to run it on the bottom because it was easier because it's right there. And then down here where I've got the chip, I've got the different connectors. Um, so this is the bottom side. So this is the one on the right and this is the one on the left. So this is the primary and this is the secondary. And on the primary, we've got... Uh, a couple of connectors here going back and forth to launch the secondary on the latch and the clock. Um, and then over here, this is, um, I think this is the latch pin. And so this goes back between the two chips. And I don't know if there's anything else to say on it. Um, all right, so let's run a test here. So I've got both the device and my tablet in screen. Let me click one. And you'll see LED light one comes on, two, seven, and so on. I don't have all of them on my dashboard right now, but I have a handful to test with. So that worked out perfect, and it's communicating really, really well. I think the LED light stays on for about 300 milliseconds, and then it goes out. Then I do have this test button here, and this is just, um, I'll need to disable this before we go into production so it doesn't accidentally get triggered. But the test cycles through each of the LEDs once, um, and you'll see right there it went from the 7 up here, or the 8 up here, to 9 up here, where it, technically I should have had those LEDs scooched over a little bit. But anyway, um, you get the idea. And then it, when it cycles through all of them once, and then it just goes into kind of a little random mode where it just randomly picks a pin and then turns it on. I think it does that 10 times. Um, all right, now I'm going to build some of these opto couplers. Now these are actually homemade. Uh, you can buy commercial ones and they're I'm sure a lot better. Uh, but these are actually using just a couple things that I had on hand. One, we're just using a, a regular white LED. Let me find my battery here. So this is uh, just a regular white LED. It's pretty bright. I did some testing on a couple of different ones that I've got. It's surprising how different they are um, on brightness. And then this is just a photo resistor. So the more light that goes in here, uh, the less resistance there is across these. So the combination of these two, what I'm going to do is they're going to be facing each other, you know, just like this. And I'm going to put them inside a piece of uh, heat shrink tubing. And what's going to happen is, is the controller is going to turn the light on. So this will get turned on inside of that heat shrink tubing. And then it's going to significantly change the resistance here. So it's going to go from a really high resistance. Uh, my meter um, was having it uh, reading beyond what my meter was able to read. Uh, and then uh, what will happen is it will change it and the resistance will be down in the couple hundred to a thousand uh, ohms. And so what will happen is, is this will essentially trigger the computer to restart because it will equivalently just be connecting those two wires together with a very low resistance. Uh, it won't be um, completely low, but it'll be low enough to trigger the computer to reset. So I'm going to build these by taking a piece of heat shrink tubing, uh, putting the two of these inside of that, shrinking the tubing, and then I'm also going to put a resistor in. So here's an example of uh, a resistor. So I just crop the lead, and I always do the negative. Uh, crop the lead, put in a 200 ohm resistor, and now I can put this inside the shrink wrap tubing, put one of the photo resistors in, seal it up. So I'm going to build a, a bunch of these, and I'll just do some random testing on them to see if they're all about the same. So far, everything's checked out just fine. 
All right, so now let's go ahead and test what I just built. Uh, here's just a computer. I've got it sitting on the floor just so that I, I don't have room on my desk. This allows us just a little bit more room to get into it. Uh, now, what I've done, and this computer actually doesn't have any hard drives plugged in. There's a couple hard drives in it, but they're not actually plugged into the motherboard. Uh, it does have um, a couple fans we'll be able to see running. And then all the way down here in this lower right-hand corner is the connector for the switch. And I, I currently have it disconnected and I've got my own wire run in. You can't quite see it, but it's this brown and black wire. Now the polarity uh, technically doesn't matter on that end because we've got that hooked up to that opto isolator. Uh, I did mark it, but, but uh, it, it, just for different purposes, but this is my, my red. I was checking it earlier for the voltage. Uh, and then I've got just another bunch wire here coming up. And this is our um, up to isolator inside that little shrink wrap. Now it's important that these wires don't touch because if they do touch, we'll end up triggering the computer to restart or start. Uh, now, ultimately this will get wrapped in uh, electrical tape and sealed up, but right now I just haven't done that. And now this is then hooked to a piece of Cat5 cable, which is all run over here to our device. Now what I've done is this, and I only have one wired up, but this, each one of these Cat5 cables will support up to four computers. So I'll be able to do four of them, which will make out the full 16. Now this device is, if we follow the cord around, actually plug right back into the computer that it's about to reboot. Now the reason that works is because most computers with the USB, they have power even though the machine is off. So from our standpoint, that works just fine. I've got the tablet right here with some of the glare. And I've got a few of the buttons. I don't have them all on, but I've got the first few. So let's go ahead and press number one, which is what this one's hooked into, and see if the computer boots. Oh, here, by the way, the computer is off. You can see the fans are not currently running. All right, so let's go ahead and press one. You can see the light on the board came on. The computer did boot up. You can see there's the fans running. Like I said, there's it's not going to make a lot of noise because there's hardly anything plugged into the computer. The motherboard is going to boot, but it's not going to be able to do anything since there's no I.O. So that actually worked perfect. So now we can do the reverse, which is we can turn the computer off. So let's press 1. LED on board flashes, and you can see the fans are coming to a stop. So that actually worked out perfect. Uh, so all of that is now good to go. We'll go ahead and add uh, some more op opto uh, couplers on here. And then I'm gonna build a couple other Cat5 cables, slightly different lengths, and we're almost done. Let's take a look at the code. Now I've exposed my own little class here called sensor base. I found that I was writing the same code over and over again. I haven't posted this just yet to my GitHub account, but I'll show you real quick. It doesn't do anything fancy. I just moved the code that is constant over and over again for each of my ESP8266 uh, programs into a, a, a base class, and then I just extend that class. So for example, in a live message and a refresh message and so on. These are all defined in here, and then I put a couple helper calls in. Um, like right here, add MQTT subscription. Uh, that way I can do a little bit of error checking and do some control as well and, and have just a little bit more flexibility. So as I change code that might be, affect many of my scripts, I don't have to uh, keep changing it in a whole bunch uh, of code, but there's nothing fancy in here. So this is gonna be very straightforward. Uh, the first thing we do is we're just defining our MQTT server. Now in this case, I didn't wanna run my own since um, um, there's not that many messages being sent back and forth, and it's just too much of an overhead to set your own MQTT server up. So I'm using this cloud MQTT.com, um, and this is just a, an example here. Um, this isn't a real login and password. I'm going to delete this instance, uh, but it's super easy. You just go through and follow the instructions to create an account. It lets you create an MQTT uh, broker. I think they call them uh, instances. And then from within here, it'll tell you what the server name is, the username, the password, and the port number to use. Uh, you can create additional clients if needed, uh, or you can just use the basic uh, uh, username. And the thing that's really nice is they've got this setup right here where you can test and send your own message. And this will be a real live uh, scrolling message. So as messages are sent, uh, we can just do test, test. 
uh, you'll see they pop up right here on the right. And then if you refresh this page, uh, it'll essentially re restart them and it'll be blank again. So for de testing debug purposes, uh, this is super handy. So I'd highly recommend just using something like Cloud MQTT. So all my paths, I start with a location followed by a device. So in this case, I'm just calling it cluster and then I'm calling it rack-01 since we'll have more than one rack at some point, uh, each one with up to 16 computers. So I'm just setting up the, the MQQT path right here and then I'm doing slash computer. And then I'm gonna subscribe to all of them. So I'm gonna do this pound sign, which means anything beyond this. And that's gonna be my subscription. And then, uh, and I'm not gonna, so I'm going to specifically subscribe to the all, but uh, this is a little bit of a catch-all. This does duplicate that up a little bit, but uh, it, it's clean enough to do this way. That way I can reuse the all message on a response, which you'll see here in a minute. So the next thing is just setting up a couple of the pins. Now, because that uh, ESP01 only has two pins, and these pins can be quite uh, picky because the they can't be low uh, on boot or else it'll go into program mode. So this was a combination that I just decided on. Other combinations I'm sure would work as well. So I'm using my latch pin. I'm reusing the RX pin, clock pin, the TX pin, data pin is pin zero. And then I was messing around with doing uh, the ME, which is the, the master enable uh, through pin two. In the end, I ended up not using that, but if you wanted to, you could set the master enable and do that on pin two. Uh, in my case, I just used a, a variable here at, in, during testing. Uh, now here I'm just doing, I've got two variables. One is the clear, so when I wanna wipe out and set everything back to zero, uh, it's just a variable to do that. And then I've got an all, which sets all of the pins, all 16 of them to high. Uh, again, that's just for test purposes. And then right now I'm using my pause delay of one second. So the pin will go high for one second and then it'll go back low. Uh, so this is something that we can tune as well. So if uh, the computers need a little bit more, a little bit less time driving that pin, uh, we could just change that right there. So pretty standard stuff. We're gonna set all these pins um, low. Uh, that way they're gonna be off and then we're gonna turn them into output put pins. And then I'm gonna just send a clear. I haven't had any problems with this so far, but this just ensures that our registry is empty. Uh, and then I've just got that on that master enable pin here. Um, in case I was using it, I was ha had that set here and write that low as well. And then I'm just using my helper classes here to set the MQTT server up. And then I've got my two subscription. This is to subscribe to the uh, pound sign, which is all of the computers. And this is just for the all. But like I said, these actually will overlap a little bit. So right here in our callback, we're doing two things. Uh, actually, there's three because I have the test still in here. But the first one is to check to see on the all. So if I send a, a turn all computers on, then what I wanna do is I wanna shift in all ones on my shift bytes. And so in that case here, I'm using this variable that I defined earlier, and then I'm gonna just send my message back. Now, I, I like to send a response back. So you saw on the tablet, uh, once it sent the message, it would then get an off message and then it would change my client app and it would set that back to off. Uh, so I, I like to do that, it's not necessary, but this just gives that reinforcement back to the user that the message was sent, received and acknowledged. And then we, in, in the case of the uh, Android app, it's gonna then uncheck the box so that you get that confirmation that the pulse has taken place. The second one is gonna be for an individual computer. So in this case, we're, we've, the computer number is the last little part within the, the topic. So I'm just extracting that. I'm just using a little bit of uh, fancy math here in order to calculate where that number is gonna be. And I'm gonna convert that to an integer because I need it as a number. Uh, and those numbers are gonna be zero, one through one, six. Uh, so I've got a safety check right here to make sure we don't get some rogue number. And then I am checking to make sure that this is the on and not the off. The reason this has to be here is because I am gonna acknowledge that with an off. So I'm gonna send an off, you're gonna see it right here, and I don't want my program to pick that up as well. So I'm confirming that we've received the on. Then once we get the on, we're gonna convert that number from the topic back to just an integer and that's gonna be stored in computer, and then that's gonna pulse computer, which is gonna pass in that integer, uh, and it's gonna send that confirmation. So we haven't looked at this method or this method just yet, and that's where all of the logic is in order to work with the uh, bit shift register. So let's take a look at that now. 
All right, so let's take a look at the first one here, which is our pulse. So this is gonna take a pin, which is gonna be a computer, and it's gonna be one of them between one and 16. I'm doing a check here, but you'll see I'm saying less than zero and greater than 16. So zero is acceptable, uh, and that would allow me to uh, turn all of the, uh, the pins low. Um, so if it gets a number outside the range in which it supports, it just goes ahead and returns. If, on the other hand, that is a pin greater than zero, i.e. one that we want to switch, uh, I've just got some real simple math in here. It's just counting up by powers of two, which is just essentially creating that one bit uh, in that one position. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a, a new variable, uh, and you'll see this is an unsigned int. Uh, there's actually a different type you're supposed to use, but I couldn't remember what it was offhand, so I just used an unsigned int knowing it, they're the same. Um, but anyway, one we're gonna start with one uh, because that's just our first one. Uh, and then we're gonna increment that up on a for loop up to the pin that was passed in. And we're just gonna constantly multiply by two. So it's gonna be one for the first one. And then obviously it's gonna pass out here and it's not gonna do anything different. If we passed in a two, then it's gonna be one times two. If it's a three, then it's gonna be one times two times two and so on all the way up to 16. Uh, so this will create one bit in that byte array in that which is being stored in unsigned int that is of the computer that we want to turn on um, so that might be a little bit complicated if you haven't done any binary math before but uh, that's one way to do it there's dozens of ways to do it but this is just a quick and easy way to so then what i'm doing once i picked what pin it is and it has the one in the byte offset i'm then going to then i am then going to call this shift two bytes uh, the reason it's called shift two bytes is because an unsigned integer is two bytes and two bytes gives us 16 computers. Uh, so that's why um, it's uh, one integer and two bytes within the Arduino uh, language. So I'm gonna shift those two bytes. And again, I don't know where that bit is. It doesn't really matter. And we're gonna now push that into our shift register. So the first thing we need to do is we need to set our latch low. Now the latch is gonna indicate that, hey, we're gonna push some number into our register. Uh, now keep in mind, there's two of them. There's two 8-bit registers because I have two bit shift, uh, shift registers. Uh, so I need to do this twice. So the first bit I'm gonna do, um, and make sure you, you've got the, uh, the master bit set correctly. So it's MSB first. Uh, so that's the um, high level going in first. So I'm gonna shift in the first byte, uh, and then I'm gonna shift those bits over eight to get to my second byte. Uh, so the first one is I'm gonna clock in the first eight bits, shift it, and then I'm gonna clock in the second eight bits, and then I'm gonna uh, flip that latch high. So that's gonna lock that in to the registry, and then it's gonna push that into uh, the bit shift register. So that may be a little bit complicated if you've never done anything like this before, uh, but this is shifting the first one into the first register, and then it's essentially gonna shift the second one in as well. So now that I've shifted those two bytes in, I'm gonna wait for my pulse. Now I do have a check here because if my bytes is zero, so if I did send a clear in like I do at the very beginning of the program, um, there's no point in waiting for a second and then clearing it. Uh, so I just go ahead and bail. So if I am sending in uh, something that's not an empty bit stream, then I wanna wait my pulse delay, which is about a second. And then I'm gonna clear those bits because I don't wanna leave that bit high. Uh, now this right here, all this is doing is it's shifting in a zero and then it's gonna shift the zero and then it's gonna sh put the second half of our two bytes into the second register. Uh, now technically this is, these are both zeros so we wouldn't need the shift, but because it's two bytes, I uh, just like to be consistent and if for some reason this changes in the future, um, one of those bytes needs to stay high, then I can just go ahead and change my variable uh, D clear and not worry about it being shifted in twice. So this is just gonna clear everything. So I'm using this library called Wi-Fi Manager. It works really, really well. So what it does is when you first boot the ESP8266 for the very, very first time, and it's never ever seen Wi-Fi before, what'll happen is it goes in and it will do a check to see if it has any um, uh, access point defined, any previous Wi-Fi, SSID, and password. If it does not, it goes ahead and pops into 
program mode or AP mode. Now when it goes into AP mode, what it, what it does is it starts a little web server on the device and it serves up, and is waiting for a connection and then it serves up this page. Now this page actually looks a little bit different. Uh, this is an old screenshot. It actually has a couple more buttons on it. But what will happen is, is you'll connect, you'll see an access point. Now on my code, the access point name is going to be the name of the device. So it'll be ESP underscore, and then it'll be the last, uh, I think it's uh, six bytes of the name. So if you had five of them booted in access point mode, you'd be able to tell them apart. Uh, this example here, it's just setting it to a, the word auto connect AP. Uh, but it doesn't matter. This will be whatever device you've got yours named. Once it boots, you can then log into your phone, go into the Wi-Fi settings, and you can connect to that device. Once you connect, it's going to say, hey, there's no internet available, which is fine, uh, and then it'll ask you if you want to go into settings. It may or may not bring your web browser up. If it does not bring your web browser up, what you want to do is you want to bring up your web browser on your phone, and you want to go to 192.168.4.1. And, what, and I think, depending on the browser, um, I have noticed that if you just type in any address like google.com, it'll catch it and redirect you to this page. It doesn't do it 100% of the time, so I think there may be something that might be different from phone to phone. But nonetheless, this is if you go to this IP address, you'll be all set. And then you can either do Wi-Fi configure or you can do Wi-Fi configure no scan. Uh, either one, you'll either see your IP, your access points, and you can click one, or you can just type one in. Now, in your case, you're going to want to type in whatever your SSID is, or pick it from the list, and then type in your password, and then click the Save button or the Go button, depending on your phone. Once you do that, it's going to take your username and password for your Wi-Fi, for your actual Wi-Fi, and then it's going to save that information, and then reboot the ESP. 8266 and attempt to connect to that Wi-Fi. If it can connect, then you're all set. It'll automatically bring your device on and then it'll connect and then it'll run whatever code you've got. So in my case, it's going to then start and it's going to run the setup code. So it's going to come in, it's going to be right here and it'll run all of this code. Now if it fails, like you typed in the SSID wrong or you had the device at home, you unplugged it, you took it to your office and you turned it back on and now it can't access your home Wi-Fi at your office. If it fails to connect, it will automatically go back into AP mode or access point mode and let you do the process again. The only downside is, is that the device will only store one SSID and password. So if you're taking the device from two locations back and forth, unfortunately you have to log in uh, every time you go to the new one and reset up the login and password. Uh, and that's just a limitation of this particular module. All right, so here's the final version. I've got everything hooked up. I only have two Cat5 cables hooked up right now, so this will be limited to just eight computers. Uh, but the other eight will, will work just fine. We just need some, some additional cables. Um, I wanted to test these uh, optocouplers out a little bit too, just to make sure they work with the computers that we're working with. Uh, they do work fine on, on my test computer, so I think they're going to be all right. So I've got these all hooked up and numbered, these little octocouplers, I have them all taped up, and I've tested each of them, and they do work. What I ended up deciding to do is I've got a, a little DuPont connector here, and then this is just a, a short cable that will go to the motherboard. Uh, that way, if anything, somebody trips over the wire or something like that, it'll hopefully break right here, as opposed to bend any of those pins in the computer. And then the other end here I have soldered on, so this will presumably just get cut, uh, cut to length, and then just use a simple connector to hook them back together, just some type of a, a standard Cat5 um, butt connector. So anyway, let's zoom in real quick, and we'll take a look at the final board. All right, so here's the final board. We've got our ESP01 down here. We've got our two shift registers, and then we've got our LEDs. I put a few labels on here. So this first side, uh, since this is going left or right to left, this is pin one or device one, and then this over here is device 16. Uh, I put a quick note here that the solid stripe goes on the top, and then the uh, or the solid wire goes on top and then the stripe wire goes on the bottom with the data and then I've subsequently labeled these uh, and then I num I labeled these with colors. I probably should have used the numbers on there, but uh, that's fine. So for power, what I've got is some old USB cables. I cut these off from old keyboards 
And so they're just the, the cable end and then uh, they were cut on the other end. And so what I've done is I've just soldered in a little DuPont connector uh, with two probes. And then on the other end I have a standard USB. So it feeds a solid 5 volts in from any 5 volt source. And then this just gets plugged into this female connector on the board. It's not the best connection. I've got some micro USB connectors on order. I'll be switching all these over to micro USB just because we'll have a better fit and a better connector. But then this LM317 voltage regulator is just kicking that down to 3.3 and then that's solid 3.3 volts throughout the entire circuit. Uh, but that's how this will get powered and it can be powered directly from the computer. So that's it for this project. It turned out really, really well. Uh, I was surprised at how well it did turn out. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I'll um, post some links down below of just some of the other information like the GitHub account. Uh, if you want to go ahead and take a look at the code if I don't forget to post it. Um, and then I'll probably do another final video once this gets installed. And we'll see how that all works in production. So that's all. Thanks. Bye.